I guess I get the, the high. You better wake them up. Yeah, I don't know about that. Well, um, I I thought we would cover some of the, the diseases that we have going on right now um, and then maybe move into some questions. I got a few short slides, uh, more pictures than anything to kind of show some of the symptoms that you may be picking up in the field. Uh, and then uh, maybe move into more of a discussion of what's going on, maybe questions you guys have in regards to the almonds and what's uh, this year. So nothing over the top, um, but a few slides because we do have to have death by PowerPoint. So uh, we'll cover uh, just some of these springtime diseases that will kind of continue on if we can get into another wet, uh, wet pattern. We'll move into some summer diseases such as uh, scab and rust, and then uh, talk a little bit about some of these new bacterial diseases that were popping up in, in almonds. I wouldn't say new, but we're seeing an increased occurrence of them, in particular in some varieties. Um, the difference between all of them is the spring diseases really need free moisture. Uh, when we, what I mean by free moisture is leaf wetness. So long periods of leaf wetness that favor disease, cool to mild, or mild to warm temperatures. When we look at these summer diseases such as rust and scab and even alternaria, we're looking more at dew. Uh, as, as providing that free moisture, so you don't need rain in the air. You just need a little bit of that uh, wetness on the leaf in the early morning that favors diseases. So we, we tend to have these no matter what, um, what the temperatures may be. And then lastly, with the bacterial diseases, warm rains. Anything over 55, 60 degrees with, you know, with rain, it, it, it really favors bacterial infections. So uh, we'll start off with anthracnos. Uh, again, warm, wet conditions. This is a fungal disease that starts off and affects fruits and, and leaves. It survives in the wood, and it tends to affect Monterey more severely than other varieties. So if you have Monterey and you see uh, fruit dropping from the tree and has this large orange sunken lesion that's gumming, and it, that's probably anthracnose. Um, it also has a very distinctive leaf lesion that follows the veins of the leaves. Uh, and it can cause a lot of stripes and yellowing within the tree. I know these pictures are a little hard, but just to give you an idea of, of what you'll see. You'll see a fruit infection and you'll see that whole spur die back as well as a lesion on the leaf. Uh, it's very easy to control with fungicides. The problem is, is we tend to have anthracnose when we have a lot of rain. When we have a lot of rain, it's hard to get enough fungicide out to provide protection. So usually if you get consistent wet, April, marshes and Aprils, uh, it's, it's difficult to provide control for this. Um, I would only suspect it's going to be a, an increased occurrence this year if we get into a really wet pattern in April. Um, shaw hole, I put this up there because um, I get, always get a lot of questions on shaw hole, and in many cases it's not shaw hole. Uh, so it is a very common disease. Rarely do we see it cause fruit drop anymore, but we do see quite a few leaf symptoms. Uh, this disease is called shot hole because it's a fungus that actually infects the leaf. It creates uh, about the, a lesion about the diameter of a pencil eraser. That fungus actually produces hormones that cause that to fall to have size out of the leaf. So you get a little hole in the leaf. It looks like somebody shot off the pellet gun. And so that's why they call it shot hole. Um, and in severe cases, it will cause defoliation as well as fruit drop. Again, this is an issue, it's a leaf and fruit issue. This is not a bloom issue, so you don't have a, a concern about shot hole until you get leaves on the tree. Shot hole is very distinctively different from other uh, leaf spot issues, mainly due to when you flip the leaf over, and you're looking at the underside of the leaf, you'll see that lesion that forms, and there will be small black specks in the middle of the lesion. Those are the fruiting bodies. So you need to flip the leaf over and look at it. Just because you have a yellow, a spot with a yellow halo that looks like it's subsizing, it may not be shot hole. Flip it over, take a look, and look for these small black specks. I can it tends to survive on wood, as well as these lesions that, that you'll see that actually have size, actually live in the top part of the soil, and that's where it overwinters. So you tend to generally have this in every orchard at any given time. You always have a little bit of it, no matter what your fungicide program is. But I will add to that is, rarely do we see serious component or problems with shot hole anymore because the fungicides are very effective. Especially when we're using, looking at strobilurins and the DMIs, so like pristine and, and quash and those types of things. If we're working more with a broad spectrum type program, um, 
it'd be a little bit different. So if you were like in Australia where they're relying on Mancazev and and Zyram and Captan and Sulfur, you tend to see, and chlorothalonil, you tend to see a little bit more of these these types of diseases because they're just not as effective with fungicides. Uh, so we'll switch over to summer diseases. Here we're really looking at um, rust, alternaria, and and scab. Um, we're kind of in the crossroads of alternaria. We, we can have some issues of it in this area, uh, but it, it tends to be tied to how much humidity that you have within your canopy. So these real tight producing orchards, uh, maybe if you have Carmel, you'll tend to see a little bit more alternaria. But scab and rust, I think, are a little bit of a no-brainer. Um, a lot of us see a lot of scab and rust, uh, rust in particular in young orchards, and, and scab, it seems like, in our, our more mature orchards. And these are what we term our summer diseases. They, they tend to be timed with fungicides anywhere from two, like for scab, two to five weeks post petal fall. For rust, um, any time into you know, April and May, and Alternaria as well, following this, we have actually have a model that we recommend. I won't actually cover Alternaria. So if you have uh, issues with Alternaria in the past, just this, this give me a call and talk a little bit about it. It's a little bit more complicated to kind of deal in the presentation because you, you look at a, a severity model to determine if you need to spray and that's what we found to be the, the, best, uh, man, the best way to manage the disease. So when we look at scab, a lot of us have seen these lesions on fruit, especially if your tree gets splashed by your sprinklers. Um, you get this kind of tar, oily, oily shaped lesion that forms on the hull of the nut. Um, although this looks bad, it doesn't really cause a lot of fruit drop. Uh, what more of concern is when we start seeing these lesions on the leaf and they start out as a faint yellow dot that you can kind of see when you hold it up into the sun and then it'll turn into a larger uh, oily lesion that forms on that leaf. Um, it eventually causes fruit drop. Scab, or excuse me, leaf drop. Scab overwinters on the wood, uh, on that one-year-old wood, and that's it. The green one-year-old wood and it overwinters its lesions. And those lesions will sporulate in the spring. The spores get kicked up with the wind. They land on leaves. They infect, and the cycle continues. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind that we're we're only we're overwintering on that green wood. And this is where some of these dormant treatments that we've been looking at and evaluating have been shown to be effective. Is that they provide control of the fungus as it's on that green wood. So copper and copper and oil, or chlorothal and oil, will actually burn back those lesions on that wood, applied in dormant, and then you have a reduced inoculum load going into the spring. So after, uh, um, when we look at the timing, so ideally we always look two to five weeks post petal fall. Um, we're well into that period at this point, we're closing in on that five weeks post petal fall period. Um, but the ultimate timing is when we see sporulation of the lesions on the green wood. So when we look up actually at this picture, you can see this nice black ring here that's starting to form. This black ring is the spores actually beginning to be released from the fung fungal body. So that's by far the best timing. That's telling the inoculums in the air, we need to get material onto the leaves to pr provide protection so when the spores land, it kills them. That generally falls between two and five weeks post petal fall. So if you think of it that way, if you're looking more on a calendar, that's generally when it occurs. Um, when you apply some of these fungicides, they tend to give you at least a couple weeks of coverage. So generally, you provide that protection if you hit it around there. Um, the real risk of scab is this you'll lose all the leaves on your tree. They'll defoliate, they'll drop the leaves. You'll see your crop still on here, and you'll be able to bring that crop home, but the following year, this is what they'll look like. So all those leaves that drop, the tree says, well, I need more carbohydrate to make it through the winter. It pushes more leaves. When it pushes that new vegetative growth, it depletes the spur pool. The following year, you don't have enough spurs to actually set crop. And you see that orchard where we had all that defoliation down here, this is hardly any flower set. So you, can, you don't really feel it in the year you have the problem, you see it in the following year, and it can cause pretty significant amount of crop loss just due to that relieving that occurs. And it's the same thing with, with rust as well, these summer defoliating diseases. Um, two to five weeks post petal fall. Um, if you're looking at a petal fall spray, I know we're past this, but 
A lot of times we go in and we, we apply very strong fungicides during bloom. Uh, we use these, these uh, motive actions that are very effective for scab to control anthracnose and brown rod and, and all these other components. And we kind of put ourselves in a little bit of a bind because what are we going to spray in order to break that rotation? And a lot of times chlorothalonil is a good fit at that petal fall component, although it does provide, being a broad spectrum, it does provide some issues with a little bit of leaf spotting. Uh, after that, you break that rotation, then you can go back in with whatever product you would like, um, especially these strong fungicides such as the FRAC3 and FRAC11, the DMI and Shrubby Learn groups. Um, I, I will add that if you are growing organic or if you don't use a lot of oil in your field, which is not common anymore because a lot of times we use oil for mite control, um, micronized sulfur sprays have been shown to be effective in controlling scab if they're made monthly. Um, and probably my mentality of if you have a history versus not no history of disease is it's really the decision of making the dormant spray or not. If there's no history of scab, you don't need to go through and make that dormant uh, with chlorothalonil, the oil with chlorothalonil or the oil with copper in the dormant. Just wait and maintain it in season until you start seeing a little bit more of a presence. Uh, just because I think it will save a little bit of money and, and you're going to get the same control. Uh, rust is very similar. It's a foliar diseases, but the biggest difference between rust and scab is it doesn't survive on wood. It survives <coughs> on leaf tissue. So all those leaves that you leave in your field or that are still on those trees that don't fall and they have rust spores on the back of them, that's carrying carrying that inoculum over to the coming year. And so that's, that's more in line what we tend to expect with rust is that we don't see it on the wood, we see it on the leaves. This means dormant applications don't provide any control for rust. Anytime you, somebody says, oh, you should spray for rust in the wintertime, that's not what you're spraying for. And if, if they insist, trust me, it's not. <laughs> um, these leaves are here. You can see the spores begin, begin to occur. You start off with the yellowing on the top of the leaf. You get these, these brown spores underneath that are kind of rust color. As they age, they turn black. And then they move with the wind on the new leaves, in fact, and, and eventually cause leaf drop. Uh, again, it's a pretty easy, uh, easy fungus to control. Almost any fungicide works on it. Sulfur works on it. It's just that you have to make sure you provide coverage in order to prevent disease. Um, a lot of kind of this lore of applying zinc sulfate uh, onto trees in order to hasten leaf drop. Um, you know, a lot of that work was done, I have it up here, and sometimes I question why I keep it there, but that work was done about 15 years ago. And that work it was done by Brent Holtz in Madera County, some of you probably remember Brent. And what essentially they did is they would apply zinc sulfate, they, the idea of that salt concentration at a very high dose, 20 to 40 pounds per acre, at a high dose in, in late October, and that high concentration of salt would cause a phytotoxic reaction to drop the leaves off the tree. And the idea is if you get the leaves on the tree, you get them onto the ground when there's a little bit of early rain, a little bit of warm temperature to expedite the breakdown of that, of that leaf tissue material. The problem is that you guys keep growing your trees so dang good and you're keeping them so fertilized that that abscission layer between that leaf and getting it to drop is not like it used to be. So even if you go through and douse these things with 40 pounds of, of zinc sulfate, it still takes a couple weeks to get these leaves on the ground. I will also add that when I see people doing this, they're doing it around Thanksgiving. You have to start a lot earlier. If you want your leaves off by, by the beginning of December, you need to put this application on probably no later than the first week of November, but I would still say late October. So there's, there's some components there that it's not as easy as we once thought just because of the vigor that we have that we're incorporating into our orchards in order to get them to grow. Um, so just be mindful that uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of money to put out when you're putting out this much zinc sulfate and it needs to go on probably late October, maybe earlier in November than we traditionally have. Again, um, rust is a summer disease, it's five weeks, petal fall on. Um, sometimes people try to partner their scab spray with a rust spray. and eh, it's, it's a hit or miss. This depends on your varieties that you have within your field. My thought is if you have Carmel in your field, probably that's not a good strategy just because it's so sensitive to scab um, in comparison to other varieties. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the bacterial diseases. Uh, we, we started picking up bacterial spot in Almond a couple years ago. Um, we, it was a new pathogen, quote, to California, but in many cases we, we, it's not new to the U.S. It, it's, 
It's been found in the southeastern U.S. for a long period of time, and we wonder if it might have came over with some stock from there, maybe as a Samsonite invader or suitcase invader. Uh, but what essentially mm -hmm. happens is this bacterial disease mm -hmm. in, infects leaves as well as the fruit. Uh, it starts off as a little bit of a spot on the fruit and has this nice yellow halo. And, and when we start seeing the infections in the fruit, you get this kind of a pencil side, pencil eraser, diameter size lesion, looks like a giant pimple. And it begins to exude the orange gum that we find characteristic with any type of damage in almond. Um, it's increase with warm rains. And being that we're seeing this as a fruit and leaf rotter, you can get an, or spotter in disease, you can get an idea that this is an infection that occurs after bloom. Um, we have highly susceptible varieties. We have Fritz and kind of a, a moderately susceptible Padre variety. We tend to see it a little bit on Monterey. I haven't seen much of it on Nonpareil. Um, there's some reports out of Australia where they battle with this disease uh, that they find they, they may feel that there's some sensitivity independence, but yet we have not seen that in California. Um, the worst infections I've seen have been on Fritz, and it's only been when we had a lot of late season, in season rains. And I will add that late in season rains tend to fall more north than south. Um, and we tend to find this disease kind of centered around the Merced River area as well as the, uh, the Tuolumne River. So that river valley as it goes through um, San Joaquin, Stanislaus County, as well as between Merced and Stanislaus County. So it's something that it probably is brought into that area. Um, I have found reports still in northern Madera County. Um, this is what it looks like in the tree. When you look up, it's hard to see, but there's a lot of little gumballs on these nuts. It looks like leaf-footed plant bud, but the difference is it doesn't have, it's, it's amber and it's not clear. Um, it overwinters in these mummies. So you see these mummies that are stuck to the tree and this ooze beginning to drop out of it in the springtime. This will then move on to uninfected fruit, spurs, and nuts. And you know, good sanitation and removing these nuts, which you should be doing for navel orange worm, will, will also help reduce the inoculum load for this. Uh, sprays, so if you have a problem with this disease, you want to start spraying early. Being a bacteria, we have to use copper. Uh, we do find some efficacy with manzate. So copper and manzate applet mixtures are, are copper only, are, are two kind of treatments. It's very similar to what we use for walnut blight. Actually, it's the same, very similar pathogen as walnut blight. So in this case, what we're looking at is, is uh, applying uh, what we call MCE, which is metallic copper equivalent. The reason why we use that term is because all the different coppers that are out there have different amounts of copper in them, metallic copper in them. We start off around a pound per acre with these first warm rains once we have leaf and fruit emergence, so you know middle of March. With every successive application, we want to cut that in half. So we go one pound, a half pound, then a quarter pound, and we're applying that preceding rainfall events. So let's back this up to this past March. We had our leaves out, leaves out in the first 10 days of March. We had rain, and it was a warm rainstorm. We, we'd go in and make this application with a pound of metallic copper equivalent. We had a two weeks of dry, and then we have another rain spell coming in. We'd go back in, we'd cut the rate in half, go 0.5 pounds of metallic copper equivalent onto these trees. And then if another storm comes up in a couple of weeks, we'd cut it in half again. And you're saying, well, why are we cutting the rate? Well, it's because almond's sensitive to copper. So if we apply a lot of copper to these trees, we'll get burned, we'll get leaf drop, we'll get a phytotoxic reaction. So this is what we found to be relatively safe as a, a safe application to prevent that phytotoxic response from forming. I will tell you that the nice thing about almond in contrast to walnut is that we can really load up the mancozeb into these treatments. So if you're coming into maybe after this full shot here at one pound, if you're coming into these cut rates you can be adding in a little bit of mancozeb as well and that provides you control for scab and rust at the same time. So you can use that to help buffer for uh, and improve any resistance. Uh, this comparison, I think when this disease first hit, we were all convinced it was anthracnose, but it never came back. It only took us uh, two years to figure that out after spray programs weren't working. Uh, but you can see the fruit symptoms look very similar. You get these orange gumballs that tend to pop up. The difference is you have this orange sunken lesion that can be quite large. 
in comparison to kind of more of a, a smaller quarter inch diameter. The least symptoms is really what, what gives it away. So here, this is what I mean by that very typical anthracnose infection. It follows the leaf. It's a very large infection in comparison to the spots with these halos. Uh, whenever a good kind of guiding component is whenever you see a, a lesion with a yellow halo, just think bacteria. Initially, think bacteria. We don't have a lot of bacterial diseases in, in almonds, but if you look at walnut blight, if you look at these bacterial diseases in almond, if you look at any bacterial diseases in vegetable crops, they tend to have a spot with a nice yellow halo. And it's because of these, these extra polysaccharides that get dumped out by the bacteria that cause that yellowing that occurs. Um, some giveaways, though, is we tend to see anthracnose more on Monterey. We tend to see bacterial spot more on Fritz. So if you think you have anthracnose on Fritz, look closer. If you think you have bacterial spot on Monterey, it's probably anthracnose. But it may not always be. Uh, this has popped up this year. This is a leaf spot caused by a bacteria. So it's not like bacterial spot that causes a significant amount of fruit drop. Um, but nonetheless, this has popped up with these rains. It's a Pseudomonas species. It causes a lesion. It's, in, it's found quite a bit in Padre and Superel. Um, the leaves will show the lesion. They'll drop from the tree. Uh, and that'll be about it. It shouldn't cause any fruit drop. If you're seeing fruit drop, start looking for other issues that may be associated with bacterial spot or other diseases. You see it on the tips. You see it here. Uh, these will get a yellow halo. They'll size. Sometimes they get infected with other things. Not a big deal. Don't get too worried about it. Um, it just happens when we get these warm rains. Okay, so uh, that's about it. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind um, with spraying is seven to ten days with rain, two weeks or so without rain, and usually the protection you have without rain is because the tree is growing new tissues. So you make an application with the fungicide, they tend to they tend to survive quite a bit of long period of time on that leaf, but then in two weeks time you have another eight inches of growth and that's no longer covered. When you have rain, you get seven to 10 days of, of good protection after that spray is made. You need about 30 to 45 minutes of dry time. So if you're spraying right up to the rain, that's usually okay. Um, tends to work. Okay, this is, this is the part for you guys to tell me. So we talked a little bit about shot hole, and one thing that we tend to get is a lot of leaf spots in the spring. And I probably get a dozen calls every year about shot hole. I got so much shot hole, I sprayed my trees you know, 13 times with fungicides. How could this be? And usually it's not, or serviceite drift. So I want you guys to tell me what this is. And you know, I gotta tell you, when Brent Holtz left Madera County, I learned so much about herbicide drift from you guys. It's amazing. I always consider Madera County to be, uh, always have a, a good time with the herbicides up on, uh, up on the leaves because I think it's just windier, uh, especially in this fireball area. Any ideas what this is? So that's what the lesions look like a little closer. We had a couple of goals. So everybody's thinking herbicide drift. This is sharp, which is similar to gold. What about this one? Shot holes. Got some shot holes. This is the goal. <laughs> you gotta remember, yellow halo is bacteria. Not not always, but you get these you get a very similar type of infection. What about this one? Paraquat. Bingo, paraquat. So you get this, instead of a, you get kind of just a dead spot, a dead tan spot right in the center of the leaf. What about this one? Yeah, a shot hole. So you see the lesion here? On the underside, you see the little black fruiting body in the center of the, center of the leaf. And here's a closer picture of the fruiting bodies. So flip that leaf over, look for that lesion that gives you an idea. One last one. What's that? You got a roundup? Oh, this is the trick one. This was uh, due to activation of cations from a, from a spray nutrient solution that was applied to a tree. So they applied a material with a lot of zinc and it rained and then activated and caused a little bit of spotting um, on, on the leaves. 
Okay, we went through this. Um, one important thing to do is to make sure you rotate, and I know you guys understand this, but just to go through it one more time, because you know we're extension agents, our job is to flog a dead horse. So <laughs> these orange dots represent different whatever populations within the tree, and the blue dot is uh, a colony or a population resistant to fungicide A. So we go through, we, we apply fungicide A, and we reduce the susceptible populations. But the one population that was resistant is still out there, and it's reproducing, and it's spreading, and it's infecting new sites. So we say, okay, we're gonna go through and spray again because we have another rain event in the forecast. So if we go through the second fungicide spray, and we decide to spray with fungicide A, what happens is we're going to continue to select only for the orange colony, but leave the blue behind. But if we choose to rotate to a new chemistry, what will happen is our, our, our ending result will, will, will remove both the blue and the orange colony from the tree. So by rotating away, we're able to control the resistant population. And that's the whole premise of rotation, is f fungicide resistance as well as insect resistance or weed resistance, it's a numbers game. Eventually, there will be one resistant population out there, and the idea is by rotating around, you can control that one that may escape, that one escape population, and prevent it from blowing up. And it just allows us to have a lot longer persistence with our, our products, whatever they may be. I think this was a lot harder concept to kind of keep bringing up until we had glyphosate resistance that formed. Now I think everybody understands resistance pretty well, is if we keep using a product over and over again, we're gonna get resistance by rotating around and keeping these products alive longer. One, they get off patent and become cheaper, but two, they just remain effective a lot longer. Uh, we rotate by the use of what we call fungicide resistance uh, action committee groups, or FRAC codes. They're always on the label, so this group 11 fungicide, which is a show we learn, um, that's what we tend to look for on, on the label to help us do this. This is a nice tool. This is the same with insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. One's called, we call it a FRAC, there's an IRAC for insecticides and the W, Wheat Science Society of America code, WSSA codes as well. So try to rotate these as much as you can uh, to fit within what you're trying to do. And I will tell you, if you use these combo products that have both a three and 11, you wanna rotate away from both of those groups that you apply. So you have to be, you wanna try to rotate away. So it's very difficult when you start mixing in combination products to, to rotate without applying the same fungus, one of the same modes of action back to back. Okay, a lot of stuff uh, online. Pete picked out uh, the IPM guideline or the IPM website. It's a lot of good material there. Um, we have our efficacy tables that are developed. And I should add that these groups change on an annual basis. So if the fungicide you're looking to use isn't on there, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Just look at the fungicide group that it is, that mode of action group, this number, and most likely it's gonna follow a very similar pattern. Um, so just be aware that just because it's on there doesn't mean it doesn't work, it's just because it wasn't tested. Uh, timings for all the various diseases, also available. And of course, um, I provide weekly updates at the Almond Doctor blog, as well as you know, get a hold of your local extension office and I will tell you, we're in the process of hiring a new advisor for Madera and another one for Fresno County. So hopefully we'll have somebody there that within tree nets that you guys will be able to, to ring and, and hopefully help educate in the future. So um, with that, that's it. You guys have any questions or?